how we can we look to reduce carbon the blasting process and also cost and consequences of that. And this is not moving. So I'll use the cursor. <laughs> sure. So the question that was asked of me before I came here is what is the explosive industry doing to mitigate costs and the carbon footprint of blasting? So I'm going to take you through for the next 30, 40 minutes or so on a couple of different areas. First of all, on how blast design can influence uh, energy consumption downstream and in the design itself, and also some of the wider things that are going on in the explosive industry outside of the specific design process as well. First of all, some statistics, I'm a big fan of these. I was on the Office for Natural Statistics the other week looking at this. Uh, I just wanted to give some context on the carbon emissions from the mining pouring sector. I've used the statistics for 2019, obviously with COVID in 2020, and the data since it's been somewhat impacted over the last few years, those recovering now or two. But I'll present the 2019 statistics. So I'm not expected to read all the small text on the right hand side, but what I've highlighted is the mining and quarrying sector. So this is just CO2 emissions. And we can see here for 2019, there were 18.5 million tonnes of CO2 emitted attributable to the uh, mining and quarrying sector. Yellow one, the biggest piece of supply there, is the electricity, gas, steam, and air conditioning supply as you naturally mean the power generation. That doesn't quite tell the whole picture though. So then I have a look at the growth value added of the industries in the UK. This is a bit like a GDP figure, but the, the value that the industries, different industry sectors bring to uh, the UK's economy. We look at the mining and quarrying sector there, quite small. Uh, 21.7 billion for 2019. But this next figure, which I put together, is where it gets a little bit interesting. We express the carbon emitted per, per pound of value added. You can see a slight change in the story here. And quarry rapidly becomes the third highest emitter per value added to the economy chains, equivalent to about 85,000 tonnes of carbon per million added to the gross value added in the UK economy. So, in a sense, we are quite a big emitter. Uh, again, power is still the biggest one, as you would expect to see there as well. This is a lot of companies are going through this process at the moment, and uh, with the emails I've had on the way here as well, it's something I'm going to be looking at a lot over the next few months as well. But we, within EPC, have started on the process of looking at where our emissions are coming from in the drill and blast process. So, this is early figures. Um, but roughly speaking, with some work we've been looking at in, in continental Europe, we're looking in the blasting process itself, the majority of the carbon emissions are coming from the drilling side of things. It's a big piece of kit. There's a lot of fuel consumption in there. As you'll see, there are some alternatives starting to come out into industry, which I'll talk about right at the end of the presentation. The drilling is actually one of the largest parts of it. We then, of course, got the manufacturing side of it, the explosives, transportation, and then the detonation itself. Thinking now about the actual blasting process and how we uh, can influence the carbon emissions, let's go through from, from the start. So first of all, we have explosive manufacture. So there's emissions involved within, within that, with the actual manufacturing of the ammonium nitrate grill, for example, the processes that go into that. We then transportation, uh, actually moving the products to site, uh, and also around the country with shipping. Inspection visits when we come to design a blast, we come out, we inspect the site, we get a couple of visits, usually at least a pre drill survey visit, and then come back again after it's drilled and do a post drill survey inspection visit. There's obviously fuel consumption of the vehicles going to site there, for example. We've got the drilling, as we said, it's a big emitter of carbon, loading and firing, and then the downstream process is the loading hall, crushing the eventual distribution. Now, as a blast designer, and I know there's a couple here today as well. Um, we can also, in our design process, have a direct influence on some of it, most notably the drilling and the loading and firing. Something we can change within the blast process and directly affect other parts of the process. But that has an impact in turn on the downstream processes, particularly the load and pull and crushing side of things. And it's these ones I'm going to focus on in the first part of this presentation today. So, how can blast results influence cost? And energy consumption. So let's look at some of the different outputs and results of the blast and how that can affect the downstream costs and energy consumption. There'll be a heavy focus on the energy part of it as I'm going through because the two are intrinsically linked. 
So, first of all, let's ask ourselves the question, what is an optimised glass design? Now, I'm sure there'll be some people who can pick holes in the glass design. It's the best one I could find in the videos I had. But put a video on the glass, it's no sound on it. But see, this is a reasonable glass design. I'm sure some will pick something up. But yeah, okay, it does go a little bit further over the bench on the next bit. I'm down as well. Okay. Um, so I've got another message coming on the screen. I don't know what that means. I'll keep more of it. So what is an optimal design? Roughly speaking, we need a blast of a sufficiently large volume. I'll explain a little bit more on this in a minute, but most of you are on the rock on ground to like contracts will know that at a certain price point, you hit a larger volume, it becomes cheaper. There's a reason for this we can't go into in a second. So we're looking for a blast of sufficiently large volume to make it work well. We want something of suitable fragmentation distribution suited to our equipment, downstream crushing plant. Suitable profile for the equipment that we're going to excavate it with. Suitable swell, because we can actually excavate it in the first place. And of course, no fly rock and minimal vibration and air over pressure. I'm going to go through in purple one to these particularly over the next few slides. This is kind of what we're looking for in an optimal design a safe and something that's excavatable and minimizes the downstream cost. So, first point of all visiting the volume perspective. I actually did draw these Molly blend traps myself. It was an evening job to play with. <laughs> so let's think we have a blast, we have a MIMU, a mobile dispersal manufacturing unit. Um, if we had a blast of a certain size and we were filling it with 75% of the truck capacity, we still got to go side, but we're only using 75% of the volume of the bulk emulsion in that shop. If we could use 95% of it, it's still one visit for that and saving visits down the line. So if we can utilize more of the truck's capacity uh, when we go to site with large blasts like that, it becomes more efficient inherently. Because overall, we've got less visits to the site. We're doing more with that one visit to the truck and the fuel that's used in usage of that truck coming to the site. Thinking of that in some actual volumetric, uh, sort of tonnage perspectives, uh, roughly speaking, in terms of rock out of a truck, let's compare a 19,000 ton blast with a 25,000 ton blast. <coughs> You still got one pre-drill survey visit for that blast, same size. You still got the drill transportation, unless you've got a drill rig inside, obviously, but the drill transportation design for that blast. You still got the post drill survey visit. And you still got the MIMO, the MIMO delivery aside for that bulk emulsion, but different tons. Of course, what this means is with all the fuel consumption that goes into bringing those things to from site, etc., and also the personnel coming to and from site you end up with a higher net emissions per tonne with the smaller blast than you do for the large blast because you've got more rock on the front. And there, equivocally, you get the higher cost per tonne with the smaller blast and the lower cost per tonne with the larger blast. It's better. So blast volume does pay uh, dividends in that regard. And this is why, as a supplier, we're always on about larger blast where possible as well. So I'm assuming in that regard. So that's the volume perspective. Now the fragmentation. Obviously, if fragmentation is not at its desired value for what we've got on site, we can end up with the infamous secondary break with the pecker radiating out across and one of those nearby for the pecking block there as well. The fragmentation distribution can also affect uh, the, the excavation cycle itself, the speed of the excavation, the efficiency of the excavation. Now, broadly speaking, if we're oversized material for the buckets we've got on our excavation equipment, you're going to fit less in that bucket, you're going to get a lower bucket fill bags, which means there's more excavation cycles to actually remove that material <coughs> in the first place. I guess I did draw this one as well. Uh, the crowd, uh, crusher power consumption downstream, we've got something that's too large for our crusher in itself. See, if it's as big as that top one you see on there, you're probably going to block the crusher and have some downtime on it as well. But equally, if it's not optimal for it, if it's too large a fragmentation, you're going to have longer duration in the crusher for it to be taken down to the correct size, using more power, and you're going to have increased wear on your crusher as well. So, impacts of this if it's too coarse fragmentation, Potentially, because the blast rate would be higher in that regard, you're going to have greater levels. It could be an indicator of greater levels of vibration on the shark as well. See, geology does have a big impact on the fragmentation, but from a geometry and amount of explosive perspective at the moment, it could uh, go hand in hand with a greater level of vibration. Because you could have an increased second amount of secondary breakage, as we saw, fuel consumption associated with that, let alone the environmental disturbance, less filling buckets, leading to more excavation cycles. 
and more energy in the cushion as well as it's got to take some from a larger back fragment size perspective. Equally, if the fragmentation is too fine, well, this could be an indication, besides the geology, geology perspective, which I accept as well, it could be an indication we're putting too much energy into the rock mass as well. That could be associated with us more doing more drilling than we require. We're putting too much exposure, we've got holes too close to space, for example. Therefore, we're doing more drilling than is necessarily required for that rock mass, leading to more explosives being used. Potentially, if things are too close together and there's too much energy, we've got an increased risk of fly rock as well. And then also the same area when you get greater levels of air road pressure, potentially an increase. Uh, Fines or waste material. Obviously, some people want the fines material, some people don't want the fines material, and be a certain product split that you may want. But uh, too much energy yeah, over that area could increase the amount of fines as well. So, volume, fragmentation. Let's move on to the profile side of things. So, we went with the minimum. What do I mean by profile? It's the distribution of the rock that's projected forward from the blast. We would usually tailor the, the muck part as best as possible to the, equip, the equipment that's actually being used to excavate it. So a shallower muck pile, something that's really spread out, more suited to your front end loader type of equipment. For excavating this, there's lots of different movements to come in from different angles and actually excavate that material and ideally loose and spread out for that with the front end loader. Shallower muck pile, muck pile but a little bit more Stacked up in the previous one, it's more suited to your hydraulic excavator. A backhoe, for example, can sit on top of a not too high mud pile and actually take an extra way to weigh that material up to the depth of the arm. A steep mud pile, well, I don't see fit this type of shovel but anymore, but you get the gist of what I'm getting out of there. They're more suited to your power shovels, your uh, ones that with the front excavation, not the front end loader, but the actual road shovel type front excavator there. Reason being, these are generally larger items of kit, there's less movement, they sit there and they pour away at the face of that muck pile there. Maximum height is, of course, governed by the kit you're using, you know, you excavate up to a certain level. Uh, and equally, if it's too low, as it's taking a pass with it, it doesn't necessarily fill the bucket fully as well, so it can reduce fill back if it's too low for it. These type of shovels can generally accommodate uh, a tighter muck pile as well, and you see them increase it. So what I'm getting at is we need a suitable profile for the kit that we've got on site. Too shallow muck pile, muck pile for the equipment. Let's fill in buckets, obviously. If, uh, if it's too shallow uh, with that front excavator type we showed a minute ago, it's not necessarily going to get a full bucket every time it takes past the front of that. You're going to have, as a result, if you've got that type of thing, you're going to have increased movement, which is slower for that type of shovel on it. And therefore, that's going to reduce the excavation speed and increase the fuel consumption associated with it as well. If it's too steep for the equipment, uh, so let's say we've got something that's designed for a front end load blast, which should not be shallow, but let's say it's too steep for it. Well, in the worst case scenario, when the tendency is too much, you know that in all, um, you might have to spread the material out more for it to efficiently excavate it, using a dozer or such like. That in turn then doubles up the handling of that material, reducing the excavation to fuel consumption as well as associated with that. Swell. Swell um, is a can is a, a parameter we quote for looking at the increase of volume from what was originally in situ in the rock before we blast it to after we blasted it. And usually will expand in some volume, volume to some degree. It doesn't because you should get an issue. Uh, so a higher swell one would generally be a looser mud pile because it's spread out more, it's moved forward, it's easier to do as a consequence of that. Whereas if something's a low swell, it's usually a tighter, harder to do mud pile, and we can do the same with some of the so. If something is too loose, um, it could be, like we talked about earlier on, an indication we're putting too much energy in the bottom mass, which causes it to swell too much, causes it to move too much as well, which you go hand in hand. Again, more exposure than required in that, si in that situation, and therefore it could lead to an increased movement of excavator if it's swelled too much and that's projected more than we planned. If it's too tight, well, we're not necessarily going to get a nice full bucket every time we're excavating into it, so you get a reduced bucket fill factor. You may actually need more powerful equipment in this case to actually excavate that as well, and therefore that can still reduce the excavation speed. 
um, increased fuel consumption. So there's some of the downstream impacts of uh, design and how it can influence uh, carbon emissions, particularly as we saw there through fuel usage on the side of the equipment government. So how can we exert control over the glass to influence these results? So one, one, one of my key things within the EPC is I did look at data and collect data. It's a big thing. I mean, when it comes to the seminars, uh, we've got one of them two weeks ago now, actually, you'll see I'm going to talk about this as well in there. It's key performance indicators. There are not, with the ones we've just been talking through there, there are a number of different KPIs, key performance indicators that would normally be assessed and recorded and tracked. First one is the fragmentation distribution. Most commonly, this is done through both sides of the map part and process through various different pieces of software to look at the distribution of sizes within the um, the rock mass there and get a distribution of yeah, what's the maximum size, what's the minimum size, where is the majority of the sizes in the fragmentation distribution. I've just realized when I'm looking at that, that blue is appalling to see on my screen. Oh, it's not too bad on your screen. Okay, good. Uh, the maximum block size would be something that would come out. I think that's going to have a big government on what can actually fit in your crusher as well, and that could be taken from this fragmentation distribution. The throw, actually, that's we talked about the throw already, recording that important with that as well. The swell, and then these also the mud pile height associated, which we direct indication on the equipment that can actually excavate it as well. Now these are different KPIs that we can actually record in glass. They're not always done over glass, but it's something that we can record and track. And if we track this type of information, we can see the impact of any changes we made in the glass design and whether it's helping to improve our downstream situation or make it worth potentially. Data at the moment, I was trying to get a, a, a photo of uh, where more often than not these glass packs are. Well, last week, when my colleague was out on site, I couldn't find quite a good example of them stacked up. But glass specifications is where a lot of this information is kept. The results of the glass, any KPIs that have been recorded, is usually in some form of paper specification at the moment. Now, this is a relatively good example, but more often than not, they're sitting usually in a basement, probably slightly damp with some mouse droppings on them as well. Might be in good condition for a year or so, but after that, they're getting older. And there's a lot of inherent information in the glass specification that's left. So, one of the things I'm working on these days, and be the advocate for it, digitalizing as much of this information as we can, because then we can actually make use of it rather than going out into retrieve it. If we can digitalize a lot of this data that's in those glass specifications, we can easily go back and look at the previous performance, work out what we're going to do in the next one. If we're going back into an area we haven't been to for a while, go and look and see what we did there five years ago, see what the outcome was, and then have some more information to help us improve and improve the situation downstream and reduce the carbon uh, emissions from the process, which really, we've described. The KPIs also provide a baseline for assessment of changes. There's various systems available for storage of this KPI information helping the trans on a week of working, but even if you just have it in an Excel spreadsheet. It's going to help in that regard. So, talked about uh, what, how it can influence the downstream process. We've talked about the storage of data. Let's now actually have, have a look. Let's have a look at how we can directly influence it through the glass design itself and the downstream parameters. Another crude drawing from me, uh, but hopefully it illustrates the point. There's um, two kind of main areas I want to talk about as an impact factor. First one would be the blast ratio, which is one of the key performance indicators, I guess, or key design parameters, should I say, which has influence on a lot of these parameters that we've been looking at. Blast ratio uses some parameters, including the, uh, the burden on the hole, spacing on the hole, the face height, get the volume, and then the density and tonnage of the rock. We've got a quantity of explosive of a certain type within the hole. If you've got the tons and the amount of explosive, you can calculate the blast ratio, which is tons of rock blasted per kilogram that the explosive placed into it. It's typically blast between three and ten tons per kilo of the requirements of that specific blast. It's not the only parameter that affects the outcome, but it, it amalgamates the different geometry and explosive parameters together, in effect, as a, a kind of measure of the amount of energy being put into that rock mass. The other one then is of course timing has a big influence, particularly on the throw and the swell parameters that will come on uh, we'll go in a little bit more detail in a second as well. 
So glass ratio, it can be viewed in effect as an energy balance. Mm -hmm. uh, um, this, an optimum glass ratio, an optimum burden, if you then compare that to a high burden on glass ratio scenario, those types of scenarios are like get a poorer fragmentation, poor as well, and as a result of the higher vibrations, the energy is not being used in the actual fragmented rocks. Conversely, if you've got a low burden glass ratio, you put a lot of energy into that rock mass, um, you know, but you improve the fragmentation, but if you over exaggerate, uh, you could end up with an increased risk of flight because you're running at really low burdens to get those uh, glass ratios higher swells, higher overpressure as a consequence. So, diving into part of that glass ratio calculation, I mentioned geometry has a big impact on the, uh, the performance of the glass. It's important to ensure to help to ensure that we're using an optimal glass ratio for the glass design. If we put too much energy into it, as we saw before, we could be over fragmenting for what we need, for example. Now let's let's just do a quick comparison between one. Here's a blast. I'll show you, let's say this is blast ratio of 3.2 tons of volt per kilogram of explosive units with a 3.6 by 3.6 pattern on a 15 meter phase. Now if we were finding we were over fragmenting that rock and we're using too much energy in it, if we slightly change the last ratio to 3.9 tons per kilogram in that, which is equivalent to expanding that same pattern design to 4 by 4 pattern more than 3.6 by 3.6, we're expanding the pattern here. The blast ratio has changed. We're putting um, less energy in per kilo, but let's say we were over fragmenting it to the first place. Now if we were checking it, we assessed the fragmentation, it was more in line with what we were after. In this scenario, We've actually expanded the pattern, and the equivalent of this would be a reduction of two holes for every 30 meters of face with this pattern expansion here. So there's a net saving of explosive being put in the ground. And if it's still achieving the fragmentation distribution you need in line with your crushing requirements, then great. We've saved the amount of explosive being put in the ground there. Save the additional fuel, additional fuel associated with that trend as well. Other things we can do with energy distribution. Uh, the type of pattern. I'm sure some of you have probably heard this debate before around square pattern versus staggered pattern. But square patterns, I admit, are quite common in this country. Um, and I've seen a lot more staggered pattern when I've been abroad. Square patterns are often easier to implement. <coughs> staggered patterns uh, provide more energy, an energy distribution. So potentially by going to staggered patterns, you get a, it's a bit of a simplistic representation of it here, but you get a better overlap of the energy. So if you've got too little fragmentation, you could potentially alter to a standard pattern tomorrow. You know, try it obviously, and that can improve the energy distribution, helping to avoid some of those areas of pockets of oversold between them. If it's an issue. We then come on to the explosive type. You see, most quarries that I are on the bulk emulsion type of explosive, didn't they? but of course, there are alternatives. And for package down burrs we see here, for example, different explosives have different properties and affect the rock accordingly. Ampho, for example, has a velocity. <laughs> uh, that's the speed of the reaction you like in the form of the explosive. Ampho is known for, um, compared to other explosives, it's got less shock energy, but more gas energy. And it, it's good at throwing the rock, but it's, it's almost more suited to a weaker rock condition, uh, generally with this inherent gas versus shock energy balance. And of course, it's only for dry holes only. Bulk emulsion, on the other hand, generally starts with a higher velocity of detonation, gives off a greater shock energy and less gas energy. So it's you can tailor it to a degree as well with uh, the recipe you usually form that and it's suited to both, both, both wet and dry hole conditions. We compare some of the properties from the technical dense uh, technical data sheets for these two products. Explosive density, for example. Here's one from a uh, uh, for Anfo. Um, you know, hold there, typically a density of around 0.8. Um, 122 kilograms in the hole here, 16 meter hole with four meter stone right on there as well. I actually can't remember what we're talking about damage or whatever. But you get it to 122. The same depth of hole, if we were to put a bulk emulsion in there, if I went to the middle of the road on all of that, all that splendid safety there, we actually fit 186 kilos in there just because of the difference in density between products. Conversely, if we look at the, the energy of that explosive as well, we didn't want when you're assessing the fixed volume of 
hole from the temporal data sheet in here would be the bulk strength, it's usually expressed as a percentage rather than relative to AMFO. So AMFO is 100%, got 122 kilos in that hole there. Now we've got 186 kilos in the same volume that we put in Plan X80, which is the bulk emulsion exposed in there. But we also we have a higher energy for that same volume as well. You'll see there AMFO is 100% bulk strength, whereas the blend X80 between 109 and 130%. Uh, so it's higher per volume than that of the AMFO, for example. So there's different energies from different products. So you can affect the downstream fragmentation, the downstream um, and the net consumption, the crushing, flow and haul, et cetera, just by varying the energy as well. Then, of course, we come to the detonators. I'm sure we've all heard about this quite a bit over the years. Obviously, there's non electric detonators and then the electronic detonators. I'm sure everyone has this instilled into them. The electronic detonators are top of a great, uh, greater accuracy of delay time in comparison to the non electric detonators. And of course, any delay time can be chosen so you can play around with the design and skip the design app if you need for the time. So, it offers flexible initiation patterns as well. So, commonly used where we want to. And we can use it to enhance the fragmentation and reduce the vibration. Talking about the timing side of things, typically in a blast, generally we will see something between five to ten milliseconds per meter of spacing. That's the time employed there. Most times, particularly if it's not electric, so you see about 25 milliseconds along the row there. Between rows going back in the blast, normally around 10 to 30 milliseconds per meter of burden. Seeking settings kind of typical one to use that. Why a lot of times volume will be too big to use as well. Timing can have a great influence on a lot of those parameters we just looked at as well. I'll, I'll slightly exaggerate to make the point here, but we had a slower timing between rows. So here I've got 120 milliseconds uh, going back on the bottom left end of the seat there. That's likely because the time you've got between rows, you're likely to get a more uh, a greater power shot at the back there and more throw from it than you were to perhaps. Go with a faster timing, 40 milliseconds back, that's going to provide a more stood up glass, as we see there. So, the timing, particularly between rows like that, can have a big influence on the amount of flow, the amount of 12 in that, uh, in that mud pile as well. Buffering, um, obviously something we try not to do, but you've got material left in front of the face as well. That obviously has an impact on its ability to throw, its ability to swell. You've got material left across the face when you're firing. It's not going to necessarily move too much. It's inhibited, it's frozen inhibited. So you're going to end up with a tighter mud pile as a consequence of that as well, more than likely. Okay, so that's the. Uh, we've gone through there how the blast design uh, can actually influence those downstream results as well. So now let's look at a little bit of a bigger picture as to what is going on elsewhere in the industry um, to reduce these emissions. First of all, talking about home examples, so something we've been doing in EPC UK recently is looking at um, in our processes we use for the bulk emulsion, how we can reduce our carbon footprint of that. And that not to be that easy in itself, but we use steam in the generation of the bulk emulsion. So one thing we've been looking at recently is okay, we've just ordered a new boiler to put in there. We're using quite an old boiler, it's a diesel one, but we're We've been looking at alternatives for replacement for the boiler, whether we want a diesel one, biofuel, hydrogen version one, or an electric, uh, electric boiler one. Uh, the nice option to go for would have been option four for the electric one. Uh, but <coughs> unfortunately, it turned out that a lot of the, the grid in the area of our factory couldn't accommodate with us. We, we put a load of solar panels back in to then substitute. To offset that energy usage, it couldn't cope with the extra going back into the grid, so we had to look at alternatives. Hydrogen wasn't quite there yet, so actually, the way we've gone is actually we have a diesel one, but it's a more efficient one than diesel. But that brings other potential options downstream. We start to explore alternative fuels for its use, and it's also available to be converted to a hydrogen one when that's more accessible technology as well. So it's future proofing it as well in that regard. Ammonium nitrate production, okay, this is not something we do ourselves, but in the wider industry, um, a process of the Harbour Bosch process, I'm going to have to refer to my notes on this because I'm not a chemist. So, uh, okay, so yeah, the Harbour Bosch process effectively uses nitrogen 
from the air and hydrogen from natural gas to, uh, to make the ammonium nitric, the ammonium nitric acid. What the industry is starting to look at now is something called green ammonia, which is rather than using getting the hydrogen from the natural gas side of things, they're looking to use other processes from maybe the electrolysis of water to liberate that hydrogen from it in the first place. Electrolysis of water, if we can get that, and they can then mix that with the air, you can get the ammonia minus the CO2 at the end of it. My understanding of it, to say I'm not a chemist on this part of it. The electrolysis of water, okay, great, we can liberate the hydrogen from that, but the electrolysis of, water, electrolysis of water in itself requires electricity to do that, the process we see here. So, okay, at the moment we might not have the emphasis, isn't us as I say, but there might not be the infrastructure there in itself to do uh, the electricity generation through clean method, but it offers the potential that if we can look at alternative sources of electrical supply, then, then this can be used. If it's a green electrical supply, it can be using the electrolysis to liberate that hydrogen and ending up with a greener ammonia nitrate rather than liberating from the national natural gas, which is the dominant method of mining. Then we're on to the actual mining equipment. Obviously, as we saw, drilling quite a big footprint from that in there, and also the excavation and all the all demand, all high energy demand. Options that have been explored for that, more generally speaking, electrification of the equipment, use of batteries in this equipment, and then they're into the hydrogen technologies, the hydrogen fuel cell, or even the hydrogen combustion. Epi Rock, or Atlas Copter, as they used to be called, have been working on it as well, for example. We haven't got one of these things, but the Smart Rock T35E is a prototype one they've been working you know, on, which is a uh, electric drawing effect. It's got the same performance as today's rig. Uh, it can be plugged in with a KV, one KV supply. Uh, it has a battery in it. Unfortunately, it only can do an hour at the moment. So we're not quite there. We have to charge it a fair bit on the standard blast pattern. But these technologies are starting to come out. Obviously, you've got the option to supply it with the one KV and keep it going as well. UK quarries, not seen so much of the one KV supply available at the moment. But in a big open pit mine, uh, not so much in this country, but with drag lines, you can get the KV more supply available for these other things. But that's something that there's development occurring in we can actively see there. Hydrogen fuel cells. Um, I found some reference to this from Forces Union Mining, who've been looking at this um, uh, combined hydrogen and oxygen to produce a uh, stored electrical energy and electric motors. They've been going through in 2021. I couldn't see much on the results of it in there, but we'll just keep that trying this on, on both four trucks and on a hydrogen fuel cell drill rig. So again, we're starting to be this exploration of alternative cells within the <laughs> And then probably what's going to be one of the forefront ones we're going to hear about a lot over the next number of years is actual hydrogen combustion. So this is almost straight kind of replacement for the diesel engine in the kit. JCB, is a, there's been a lot of news recently around what they're doing they developed a test uh, prototype <coughs> combustion engine. Those types of things, because it can almost act as a direct replacement for what's in the current technology, it simplifies modification of this kit to take it. And that's where this, this is something they're working on. It's almost like you fill it up pretty much like you do with hydrogen instead. So to summarize, and I think I've gone way too quick. <laughs> just, well, we've gone through a number of different areas. First of all, I've emphasised the blast design can have a direct impact on the downstream cost and the energy consumption there. And what I'm help, hoping to do by emphasising this point is to equip you with the knowledge to actually ask your design teams to alter the blast if something's not quite right, and it can you can reduce your downstream uh, energy consumption from modifications to fragmentation, to modifications to throw modifications to swell, etc. The idea is to give you a bit of knowledge to go and ask that of your blasting teams and modify things that you need to work with best and more efficient processes downstream. Now, we've just touched on other areas that we looked at um, research and development perspective, uh, drill and blast process, and also in the wider quarrying sector uh, to reduce the consumption of direct use of the kit. I think over the next one to two years, we're going to see quite a lot more innovation in this area. I know we're exploring. Alternatives in uh, emulsion formulation, for example, in carbon reduction sense as well. I think we're going to see a lot more kit coming out, particularly around the hydrogen area over the next few years. That's uh, 
that helps reduce these downstream impacts. Blasting, obviously, we're using a lot of energy. There's a lot of goes into that process. It's a hard one to change overnight. But what I just want to emphasize is how the blast design itself, ensuring we've got the optimal design function, can help with these downstream benefits, downstream reduction, downstream reduction in energy consumption as well. That's it. I'm amazed my voice lasted because, uh, as Debbie, I think, was on the call as well, I was doing an open day at Watley Quarry last week. I spoke 5,000 people came through the door. I think the way my voice was yesterday, I think they actually spoke to about 5,000. <laughs> but I hope that was of interest. I know that some of you have already got quite a lot of blast experience in your audience, but I hope it was interesting. Yeah, any questions I'll be around for a while? Yeah, no, thank you. That was an excellent talk. I think it's obvious that you're from your talk then. Large blasts are the way to go. You have drilling and transport account for the large percentage of carbon emissions. You know, large blast is great. Also, the blast design to suit the type of equipment on site is fantastic. But you come to the mine tell I tend to work on a kind of cost per ton basis. Don't like really altering that yes. to all those parameters. How would you persuade like my company to optimize that blast if it's not within their parameters of, of courses? How would you persuade them that down the line? You can see benefits. From the costing perspective, um, if we were over, let's take a simple one first. If we were over fragmenting your rock or the right, was over fragmenting the rock, I mean, if we can, <clears throat> you might have a, a lower cost of ton, you'd be using less explosive in it. So that's an easy one to sell if, if uh, because it will cost you less per ton of rock you're blasting in the ground. For other one, the downstream benefits, this is where these mine to mill products projects coming really and this is i've seen an increasing increasing number of these over time i've been involved with the industry where we're partnering more much more of a partnership with a supplier where we're sorry, with the supplier and the customer where we're looking at whole projects in a sense to look at the whole downstream process and how this impact is and it needs that customer buying from that we've got a number of projects running at the moment where we're just doing exactly that looking at the whole part of it working with them to see the impact of that data changing further down the stream. One of the projects I'm involved in at the moment is looking at bringing data from disparate sources, uh, Crusher, for example, Crusher power consumption, the downstream metrics that we can get these key other KPIs, bringing that back into a central dashboard so that we can easily demonstrate to the quarry, okay, if we do X on the blast, Y happens, and we can see that change in the data. I think we're going to see a lot more of these partnership type projects, all mine to mill projects going on. And as I say, data is a big thing, mine, collecting all this data together so it, it can be more easily and quickly demonstrated that a certain change has been made is having a direct impact on your crushing, on your crusher downtime. I mean, they're getting telemetry on a lot more of these haul trucks uh, as well now. Um, we, we're, we're doing some work looking at truck tracking on that as well at the moment. I know a lot of the uh, the contractors around that side as well, and the haulage contract also looking at putting more uh, equipped telemetry equipment on it so that it starts to look at okay, what's our bucket build back? What's our ordinate haul time for this? What's the <coughs> need pressure at what time? What blast is it going to? It's pulling all this data together. I think it's going to help us to demonstrate to customers how changes can improve things downstream. So, you analyze that? Is that going to consultants then to, to uh, work on it again? It's early stages of that, yeah. but at the moment, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other engineers as well. <laughs> so, okay. Any other questions? In your opinion, is electronic against shock tube more efficient and more carbon friendly? The direct comparison between the detonators on carbon, it, neither here or there, it's addressing the carbon point of view first. It's it's again linking back to how we can take crushing, for example. If we can achieve a better result, which we can't do just by substituting electronics in for non electric, if you know what I mean, there's more goes into it than that. But if we can achieve a better result using electronics because of that accuracy, yeah, if we can reduce, we can improve your fragmentation to the point that it reduces your crusher power consumption, or crusher downtime, et cetera, then that, yes, it's downstream, but it's helping to reduce the amount of power being used in the crushing. And, Therefore, the carbon footprint of that. Electronics have a place. I'm not going to say that bus moves to electronics, it solves everything, because as we all know, if you just have a non electric glass and you immediately put electronics in there and use exactly the same timing, yeah. probably actually can make it a little bit worse in some sense. 
Um, but there's an optimization that goes on, isn't there? So yes, if we, we, we can, there is modeling that can be done on the blast, both with the vibration perspective as well as the fragmentation, obviously. And that's one of the things that uh, electronics have a benefit is, uh, my thesis I did was on vibration, so I can go on about this for quite a long time. And I know that's not carbon consumption, but yeah, it's clear advantages uh, with uh, minimizing vibration of electronics, but it's the same with the fragmentation. We can have a more optimal usage of that energy in the blast using electronics. We can choose the exact time we want, and that's the real benefit of them. And it's the impact of the downstream is where we can save the carbon. The actual detonators themselves, there's not much to do with them. Thanks. Any other questions? No? Well, happy with that. Oh, very good. Thank you. Yeah, excellent, John. Uh, for those who want to do a meal in the restaurant, and after the meal can ask the committee to stay on for a quick 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.